Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Wednesday Night America. I'm your host, Roger Nodiega. Thank you for joining us. It is May 10th, 2023. Let's get to it. The Courage to Look 2023 project. Two years ago, Eugene Castillo and his collaborator, Chris Jamison, had a vision to lead white allies through a journey together to look at the historical roots of racism in America. Uh, thanks, Roger, for having us. Uh, I'm Eugene Castillo. I'm Chris Jamison. Uh, and yeah, um, January 2021, um, I sat down with Chris, uh, and it was uh, the, the first year of the pandemic. And I, and, and you know, the newspaper um, front covers just kept everything was reminding us of of the aftermath of the George Floyd murder, and I said to Chris, we got to do something. Yeah, um, it, it was a, a moment that we felt we wanted to take advantage of. It seemed like the world, both because of COVID and we were all at home and also because of the the tragic nature of George Floyd's death, we felt it was a opportunity to try to use our own experiences and our abilities as, as listeners and facilitators to guide people to hopefully have a clear understanding of what the history of our government has been towards POC. So uh, we basically said, you know, I, I've spent my entire career in nonprofits uh, in one way or another. And uh, I said to Chris that, uh, you know, we're not sociologists, we're not psychologists, we're not you know, giving people a certificate. What can we do? And uh, this this book uh, that is forms the, the centerpiece of our, our our project, our course, which is basically kind of a um, um, a glorified book club, um, Professor uh, Ronald Sataki's book, "A Different Mirror: um, uh, History of Multicultural America," uh, it, it is what we use as I read this book you know, about eight years ago for the first time, and it just was shattering for me. I don't know. Um, Chris has, has read it in and out um, in the last few years, how you felt about it. But uh, it, it to, we're not, what we're presenting is not something, you know, of, you know, the nature of a critical race theory type of project. We're looking at a, an historian's um, uh, documentation of uh, uh, the historical um uh, the, the historical roots of racism in America. Yes, uh, it was a, 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 an entryway to try to guide people on the journey that Professor Tataki guides the readers on um, a way to, and he does a, a great job of of bringing up various points in the sad and unfortunate histories of POC of, in America and um, their hand at the, um, you know, and, and the, their leg and the unfortunate legacy that the white led government throughout the course of America has enacted. So, um, uh, gentlemen, this book is available for purchase now, is it not? It is. It's, it's been around. It's been um, reprinted a number of times. And I think it's in its, I think, sixth edition. I have to check it, open up the book. Uh, uh, but it, it, it is, you know, f f f from a historian's viewpoint, it is, you know, the factual history of America. Uh, it includes parts uh, of the story of Canada and um, the, uh, the uh, First Nations in Canada. Uh, not, but it's it's really focused on America itself. But even just that is is enough. I mean, it's a you know three hundred plus odd page book. Um, and so what we do is we walk uh, white allies through the various chapters of the book. They read it on their own. We gather four times and we have discussions. Uh, uh, frankly, I think one of the problems, in my you know humble opinion, about the racial divide in our country is that uh, we don't know how to have frank discussions with each other about the uncomfortableness uh, of race. 
knowing things as they are, and I've had conversations with many folks myself, and it's very difficult to have a conversation. What will be the method? How will you be able to break that down? Because, and gentlemen, I'm not meaning to entrap you in any way whatsoever, but uh, people aren't listening. It is their point to win. It's a debate on steroids. It's a no win debate. It's they want to hear themselves prove their point because they themselves know no one is listening anyway. How do you propose to do something? And if it's a convoluted question, Jim and I apologize. It's not meant to be. No, it's a good question. And um, and, and you're right. It is a it is a hot topic and it is um, you know, full uh, is is full of uh, you know heated emotions. But you know what our course does, having having gone through it once, you know, in 2021. What our course does is we we present the historical material, we break it down into different um, segments, and we augment it with conversations, uh, conversation starters. We augment it with reflection uh, in our group discussions, uh, as well as comedy <laughs> uh, and other supplemental materials. Um, uh, because some of the history, a lot of it, frankly, uh, it, it, it's not easy to swallow. And mm, so we didn't want people to just kind of get mournful and uh, have to go off uh, on, on, on the Prozac nation <laughs> <laughs> sort of, sort of uh, bandwagon after the course is over. We wanted people to feel hopeful uh, after having experience. And we also do... Um, uh, study groups, small study groups within our, our course, and um, some role play. Uh, Chris, I noticed that in with the flyer, and we'll go to the flyer shortly in, in your program materials, one of the first individuals that you mentioned is someone that I regret I never had the chance to meet on a personal level. Uh, before she passed away, I was asked if you had a chance to meet anyone, who would it be? And for me, it's Rosa Parks, believe it or not. And for me, it was because, and I don't want to get into the hardcore history. There is a debate here on the actions that she took. But the point is, she took the actions that she did, knowing what she did, because she'd had it. It was done. She stood up, or in fact, she sat down. And I'm not trying to minimize it. She took the action with all the repercussions that would come from it. No one desires to be arrested. No one looks for that. It is fearful for everyone. No one wants to have that. And you chose, or you gentlemen chose Rosa Parks. In 1955, we know what happened. Rosa Parks defied. Why is she the first one that you list on this? There are other people that have stood up as well. Why Rosa Parks? Well, I think Rosa Parks you know, kicks off that particular phase of the civil rights movement. It was the time where mass um, demonstrations were becoming popular and the go-to way to bring attention to the movement and and cause leaders and politicians to take notice of the size of the discontent um, of Blacks and other POC during that time. Um, and also Rosa is also a very powerful figure. You know, she's a very slight woman physically, but you know, as you said, like this, the amount of courage and um, dignity that she showed, you know, during that time and throughout her time with the civil rights movement was very impactful and, you know, transformative. So, and I think, you know, you know, the courage that she, you know, had, we were kind of wanting to use that as an inspiration for the people to who would join with us to to <coughs> to acknowledge you know what what she had brought when she decided to to stand up by sitting down i understand that both of you will be facilitators but it is not just yourselves correct there are other people involved as well let's go ahead and put them on blast because that's what we do <laughs> In a good way. <laughs> yeah, we have we have um, two of our so-called graduates from our 2021 uh, round of the Courage Look, 
um, uh, Catherine and Ellen, uh, whom uh, we had realized uh, a couple of things uh, when we um, did our po postmortem after the first round of the, uh, of the course. We realized that both of us are um, obviously persons of color. We also noticed that both of us are um, male. And so part, uh, you know, the patriarchal mm, mm, uh, you know, embeddedness in our structural systems is part of the problem. It's, 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 it, race is, is a very complex web of knots, if you will. Uh, and so we, we acknowledge that, uh, that, you know, we as facilitators lacked the ability to reflect um, the, the power that uh, women have to be able to enrich and prompt discussion and, and harvest wisdom uh, from genuine reflection. And one of the things that, um, that I was thinking about the last couple of days is that, um, you know, it, first of all, it's very easy for me to talk to you, Roger, you're a person of color, uh, because I know whether or not I know your stories uh, and what you've gone through in your, in your number of years of life, uh, I can relate to all of them. Uh, and so it's easy, I'm just reflecting that it's easy for me to talk to you about the importance of, of uh, reflecting on, on racism in our society. But when I'm speaking to my white friends, it's much harder. There's always this resistance because of mm, the complex web of, of, of knots that we have. And it, 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 I was reflect. I was watching this uh, documentary a few days ago on um, the rebuilding of Notre Dame Cathedral, and the thing that struck me, and this is one I would bounce off Chris, uh, is that we can, you know, we, we human beings can rebuild Notre Dame in X number of years. Why can't we be rebuild what's fundamentally flawed in our society? It is something that is very difficult. I do not even pretend to have an answer, but I'd like to believe that maybe it begins with, in the same manner that you mentioned Notre Dame, it takes steps. It takes buying a particular or procuring a particular material and then another one and another one. Sometimes you mix them, sometimes you weld them, sometimes you hammer them, and all of it adds up to something that's greater. But we have to start somewhere and using the notre dame analogy i believe this is a little bit of that as well it starts with one simple act of choosing to get together because this is a choice right gentlemen to do this to have this conversation is wanting to understand what a conversation is and to want to actually have the conversation Right, right. Yeah, we want the participants to feel emboldened, you know, it, you know uh, to use that word, um, or at least more comfortable having these kind of conversations like in the coursework, we do role play activities where two of the participants will engage in a conversation like in various settings like the workplace or at a family gathering. And one person will be the kind of um, uh, the Archie Bunker of the side of it and the other person will be someone who is you know graduate from the course and is more um you know more enlightened you know or to or more uh, aware of the history of the of the country and so they both talk to engage in the conversation without necessarily falling back to talking points or getting into um just kind of what you were saying earlier talking without while recognizing the other person isn't listening so we try to get the participants over the the four group meetings and the coursework, you know, as they're interacting with their study partners to um, feel comfortable talking about it and realizing that um, they do have the ability to shape people's minds, even if even if that step is small, it's still significant. It's a small step, but the ask here is to actually reach down, deep down and to have the courage to want to have that conversation. That's what you gentlemen have named this. It is, and uh, please, the courage to look. To look. And that courage to look 
is to see what we don't see, right? Right. Wow. Um, there's quite a bit to this. Go ahead. You there's, can... there's the uh, Chris is a graphic designer, and uh, we, he chose an image. Maybe this is a good time to share the image of our flyer. Uh, he chose an image. Um, maybe he could describe it, but it's basically if you just look at this this uh, um, cavern of darkness, uh, light is shining in, but you can also um, you can also interpret it as light shining out from the darkness. And so, by just having conversations in a safe space. Uh, and uh, accepting that it's going to be awkward and uncomfortable, uh, we're hoping to, to 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 not only learn new things about our our history that we didn't know, but also just to talk about it. How do we talk? If you know, you, you mentioned how difficult you know the, the 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 climate is with this particular topic. How, you know, we're trying to teach uh, um, a group of people not only the, the the history our history but that it's safe to disagree um but it takes practice learning how to do it and we don't just stop there we listen and inquire and reflect uh, uh in contrast to the knee-jerk reactions that we have that you know society is embedded in us sort of the the default um the default mode of reaction it's a wonderful image. And if you uh, scroll up to the top, it says we cannot escape history. Our inheritance today, a certain degree of freedom comes from the investment and sacrifice of the courages of courageous leaders and ordinary folk from history. And this is the challenge, the challenge that you have. And this is what you're putting out there. This is impressive, gentlemen. I, I, when you first mentioned this to me, I was like, Gene, what are we doing? Where Eugene, what are we doing? Ladies and gentlemen, forgive me. I've known him for a long, how, how long? 1983? Oh, dear, yeah. Yeah, I just dated <laughs> ourselves, both figuratively and literally, right? Sorry. And even then, I may have butchered it's it. Nice. I'm a bit nervous. Uh, I do apologize. Uh, it, it's, but knowing this and seeing it, the material, I am impressed by it. Are you, gentlemen, able on your screen? Can you move up to the top so we could see the top of the flyer right there? Thank you. Right trying. now, it's kind of at the bottom. And there it is. Look, the question is, are you willing to look with courage at history at the future? As you say, we cannot escape history. Our inheritance today, which I believe I just may have read that. Our society has suffered enough. Have you? Over the last decade, visionary and brilliant spiritual leaders paved the way for diving deeper into the societal and historical issues that underlie why racism is still a problem today. Paying lip service to the crucial fundamental change that needs to occur before the roots of racism I understood is not enough. We must do better. The question is how? I think we've discussed some of that. What else, gentlemen? It takes courage. And that's where I mentioned the individuals there. First, Rosa Parks. Than Dr. Martin Luther King. Why do you mention him as opposed to other brave people as well? Well, I think, you know, similar to Rosa Parks, like I, I think when a lot of people think of the civil rights movement, they think of Dr. Martin Luther King, you know, giving the Eye of a Dream speech or, you know, marching on Selma, um, you know, just kind of being one of the, you know, most important people of the 20th century, at least in terms of America and and, and race, um, and um, we wanted to also, you know, remark that um, that you know the type of courage it took to to you know to sit in jail and, and write or to put his his life on the line literally through his work, like that that courage is also. But, you know, again, what we're trying to um, inspire in people to, to, you know, kind of, you know, you were talking earlier about this cave and, you know, caves can be kind of scary places, even with light. And so, you know, yeah. and, and this, this image, like it's, you know, it gets symbolized like uh, an aspect of someone's mind that's, that's, 
cracked open. And so, you know, the work that they were doing to to communicate, you know, as they were reading the book, you know, as and the information and the community they formed, you know, was shining a light, you know, not only on the the sad and you know twisted history of the government, but also the you know, part the you know the kind of difficult parts in themselves that maybe on a level they weren't acknowledging was contributing or or was um was connecting them to that history of the government i thank you chris i understand that you gentlemen in this course you may even be talking about unconscious bias is that correct yeah um, a lot of people don't know what that is and those that think they know still don't know <laughs> what is unconscious bias uh, you know, it could start, uh, you know, the unconscious part, l let's start here. The unconscious, I'm not, again, I'm not an expert. There are so many experts out there. If you want to get a credential in this or some certificate, there are lots of worthy programs. What we're doing is we're just learning how to talk to one another mm -hmm. using the evidence of history. So let me just start with unconscious bias. Chris can answer himself, but uh, the, it starts with a positive statement. It's not your fault. It's unconscious. It is something that we've inherit. One has inherited. So, and then there's the bias part, which is the part that we don't see. That's the darkness of the cave. So, I, I mean, let me just give answer your question, Roger, with uh, a short story. Um, uh, um, yeah, I think a year ago or two years ago, when when there was that mass shooting in, in Buffalo, where it was clear that the targets were. Um, black and brown people. Uh, I, I was I was absolutely just you know floored and devastated, and um, and a I uh, was talking to a white friend of mine who um, hadn't checked the news that day, uh, and then checked the news and saw the news reports, and then her response was, "How sad." And then a couple weeks later, were the um, uh, shooting of children in Uvalde, Texas, and uh, the response there, and here, you know, children are involved, the response from this same person was, uh, um, let's say, exaggerated. It was, it was 10 times exponentially more, more empathetic than, than the uh, Buffalo shootings. So this is a very, very subtle example of unconscious bias. Of course, unconscious bias goes into our societal structures, the structures of our institutions, our workplaces, our, uh, our, our places of worship. Um, and uh, it, is, um, it is, you know, uh, something that needs to be inspected, something that needs to be examined. Um, did I cover cover that? Okay. No, that was wonderful, wonderful as, as usual. Um, yeah, I, I think the issue with the unconscious bias also ties into, you know, the notion of the course guiding people to have conversations because I because I, right, right, justifiably so, race is a very charged topic and i think people don't always realize that they don't realize that their bias is causing them to react in the way that they are or that um or that their perceptions of like a a, a black person for instance is is rooted in unconscious bias that like if you take someone like President Obama, who um, you know was you know given a lot of you know flowery um, adjectives to describe him, like you know the way he speaks, the way he commands an audience, you know his his intellect, and I think a lot of people, you know maybe you know if you've seen the movie Get Out, where you know there's the uh, there's the guy who says you know he would have voted for Obama three times, like yeah, I mean Obama was a really you know a good president, you know depending on where you stand on politics, but you know, would people have been so stunned if, let's say, 
Bill Clinton had those same attributes, you know, if he made those same policies. So I think just kind of on a subtle level, like sometimes we don't, sometimes our views of other groups are based because over time we've learned to devalue certain people. And that's not necessarily someone's fault if they buy into that because it's usually until someone's much later, until you've, in, until you've witnessed you know, the effect of unconscious bias, whether it's policing or something someone says to you, something someone says to you in a um, personal conversation that it comes up and you have to recognize, wow, you know, I really do feel this way. But I think this course <coughs> gives an opportunity for, for people in a safe space to say, you know, I feel this way, I don't like this. And, you know, here's what I did to try to, um, to change my perception so that I do look at people with a clear eye, with a more accurate and and um, dignified perspective. Let me retool the re, let me retool the, the 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 question you pose. What is unconscious bias in a different way, um, Roger? If and, and I know known you for decades, but if I if, if something that I consistently said with my words um, continually harmed you or harmed your family. You would want me as a friend to look at my words, yeah? Yes. So what we have with unconscious Well, I would tell you personally. <laughs> <laughs> but we would but, laugh about it. But let, let me put this caveat in. Uh, I'd like to know where this is going, but you and I communicate because we are open to one another's thinking. So yes. we're fortunate there. And we are culturally different as well. And so, this is what can happen with society. When we are genuinely friends with one another, we can talk and laugh at our mistakes and see how our words or our structures or our institutions are harming one another. This is the whole point. Yes. Unconscious bias, in my opinion, and I am no expert, is fear itself. It's the manifestation of fear. And you gentlemen ask that question, do you have the courage? It's it's like, do you get it? Or even if you don't, do you want to look at what this is? There's another point of view. Oh, I didn't want to say that. There's another way of, uh, well, okay, I'm going to jumble this now. But the courage that you gentlemen want to share is actually acknowledging that there's another way to look at it, for lack of a better word. And I'm going to, I'm going to jumble it. I, I know, cause I've been trained and I say that very carefully that I know <laughs> what unconscious bias is. I am a minority and I've suffered from it and I denied it. I, I'm, I helped, I'm a minority. How the hell? And I saw it. I witnessed it and I struggle with it every day. And it annoys me to no end when other people don't even want to take that one step. And I am talking about everyone. Minorities themselves have unconscious bias. This is a very difficult subject, gentlemen. And I admire you. I respect you that you want to do this. It starts with one step, and it's right here. And I, I'm thrilled to be a part of it. I'm going to lose everyone when I say I'm an activist. Activism is now a pejorative. That is sad. When you look at what America is, we are activists. This is what we are. 1776. Well, okay, 1775. But <laughs> we're activists. Now it's a pejorative. And that is sad. It's who the, the, the social justice war the a social justice warrior today is a pejor. It's 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 a negative. People don't even know what that really means. Social justice has to do with dignity, doesn't it, Chris? Right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's yeah, crazy. Yeah. But I, I, I am already taking away from you, gentlemen. Let's go ahead and continue with this and tell us what is the requirement? How do we get involved? How do we choose to take this step forward? And I may have cut you off, Chris, and I'm sorry. Come back and just give me the old slap across the head. <laughs> It's what I do. I've oh, been on you, this forever. Thank you, message. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris. What was that? 
No, um, yeah, uh, right now we're accepting applications. So um, anyone who's interested, we have a link to, um, to or actually you can go to, um, if you send an email to courage to look at gmail.com, that's courage with the number two look at gmail.com. Um, you can get in contact with Eugene and myself and we'll go through the uh, set of directions. But basically what you would do is um, you would, uh, you would write a brief um, description of um, what, what is your inspiration to join the course and what you, would want to see yourself grow into as a result of taking the course. And then um, Eugene and myself will read your read your response. You can also um, record a video, like maybe three or four minutes of you um, uh, talking into your phone and just sending it, sending it into that email address. And so, you know, uh, depending on our ability to sense your sincerity and your commitment, you know, to, to go through the, um, go through the course where we'd be more than willing to have you uh, participate with us. Yeah. Let me just say that, you know, honestly, this is, as you said, Roger, this is such a hot topic. Anybody who clicks or emails us and just says, I'm interested, I don't even know where to begin that, it, you know, suffices as, as sincerity. It takes just that to want to take that step. Gentlemen, I, I can bore you and an audience with my experience uh, in 2005. Tell us. I had, well, this is, this is uh, I worked with an individual when I was on leave from my employer where I was working for my union, SEIU. And I had to deal with people that did not have my belief systems, my lifestyles. It was a lifestyle uh, choice, maybe I would say. And at the time, I was like, oh, great. I have to work with the individual. And then it turned out to be one of the greatest six months of my life that I had a privilege to understand. And it was a lifestyle behavior. May not be the same thing. And I don't want to, you know, compare, equalize, or anything. It's just I had an, uh, a situation back in 2005. I didn't exactly live with the individual, but I worked with them on a regular basis. And I now consider myself fortunate that I had that experience. Yeah. And now I equate what you gentlemen are doing as another opportunity on being able to learn and experience. We're never going to walk in the other man's shoes or the other woman's shoes. We're never going to do it. But this is the first step, right, gentlemen? It's what it takes. Um, yeah, it, It's very touching at the very end of uh, Professor Chitaki's book. Um, a different mirror, he writes an epilogue. Um, he calls it epilogue. And he talks about getting into cab and, and you know, has this experience. And so one of the things we ask our, um, our, our participants to do uh, at the end of reading the book, having these discussions, having these activities, doing the study groups, uh, watching the comedy videos, uh, is we ask them to write their own epilogue. How have you changed? And this is, uh, you know, one of uh, one of the powerful things for me when we did this. Uh, and, and and maybe I'll I'll share this link uh, with you. Um, we uh, put them up on a blog spot, and people who are considering joining. The course, or just want to learn more about what a, you know, a change of viewpoint, uh, what change of uh, having some light shown into one's history and one's um, uh, ancestry. Uh, let me just uh, see if I can um, just show you that uh, that um, the blog spot. Yes, mm -hmm. and while you find that, I do want to give a shout out. Thank you for joining us, Tiffany. Weiss in the chat room. Thank you. We have a like from Tony Kanopka. Thank you for spending the time and visiting with us. And if you have any other questions or comments in the chat room, fire away. Eugene, I'm going to bring that one on right now. So I'm just uh, scrolling through some of uh, 
the, uh, after mm, four months of, 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 of conversing about this material, this is, uh, this is uh, basically um, what uh, people wrote uh, as their you know, uh, final experience with us. A, a, a courage uh, to look epilogue that is may I have hard. that I'm yeah. sorry may I have that link uh, yeah. spell it out for me and then I can put it in the Chiron at the bottom or the little thingy that goes across the screen <laughs> I can put it there uh, yeah I should put it in the private in the chat in, uh, oh, if you can and then I'll copy it and we'll put it up right there, there I apologize go. for interrupting you on that yeah, oh, no, 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 wow no. look at that that was quick all right, and uh, let me copy that link, and we're going to put it as a, uh, a little banner right now. So, folks, there you go. And, Gene, please continue, because I so rudely interrupted you, because I've only been doing this for 15 years, and I want to hear myself talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the participants just wrote their own epilogues, sort of as the final final um, hurrah of our, our time, our journey together. And it is a journey. The journey of maybe I, the Dalai Lama has said this and has quoted this uh, again and again. The one thing that every single human being on earth has in common is the desire to be happy. That's where we start. This, I mean, we don't study the Dalai Lama in this in our course, but with that starting point, there is then the poten potential or the potentiality uh, to have a, a little bit more harmony. Uh, among um, our, our co-centric circles in our lives. And um, I, I, I've said this at the end of our course two years ago, but I'll say it again now, what it takes to make any kind of um, movement happen um, is either a Rosa Parks moment or a Dr. Martin Luther King moment. Um, you know, another person um, that we, we uh, admire very much and talk about a lot in our course is Senator John Lewis. Uh, what it takes is uh, not just courage, but it just takes being able to slow down and talk about the difficult things. Talk about our difficult history and to see how it um, is affecting our structural institutions today. Um, going back to the desire to be happy uh, idea um our, our our premise was very simple um at the beginning which was this if we see the uh, uh, historical roots of racism if we see the causes of our suffering we might have a chance to be able to uproot it Did you wish to read a comment or two, maybe briefly? Don't have to read the entire thing, but something that stood out. I believe, gentlemen, receiving each comment is a great deal. But if there's one or two that you wish to highlight. From the epilogues? Uh, from right there, yes, the epilogues. Uh, yeah, maybe we need to run to church to this one. Or if you don't have one in particular. No, no, there's one here that I want to um, maybe just... Um, there it is, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, a courage to Look, this is by David, Dave S., a uh, 2021 participant. Uh, and um, he immediately, in the first um, paragraph of his uh, epilogue, says, For me, these American myths were already on their sickbed prior to starting the book. And though the dismantling of these myths seems more thorough and complete in reading the comparative survey, my cousins used to call me Davy Crockett when I was a small boy after the folklore TV character, the King of the Wild Frontier. And I don't recall that Davy Crockett died defending the right of Texans to own human slaves was a major theme of the show. Uh, and so this type of, you know, eye-opening things to our, our own personal histories, as well as our collective histories, is part of this light shining down in this cavern. I want to emphasize, and hopefully I'm not taking from you gentlemen, this is not a history lesson, ladies and gentlemen. This is not, this is the way you think it is, or this, yeah, it, you're not correcting. You are enlightening. You are sharing. Because the minute you begin to say, well, we're going to educate you on the way things really are, it's over. 
because that's that echo chamber, right? People don't want to don't want to hear what feels or what they think they know. This is something beyond that, right, gentlemen? It is yeah. taking us step. Chris, please. Yeah, I think in general, like you know, if you're dealing with the, you know, if you're dealing with anyone, you, know, you get better results if you get them to participate on their own rather than telling them the st the road steps of how to get a certain tasks completed. So, you know, what we try to do, you know, what the study groups and in the in person, um, excuse me, the virtual groups um, and the study groups is. Um, present opportunities for the participants to have kind of genuine moments of, of, of uh, insight so that they're putting together the pieces of this puzzle on their own. And I think presenting it in that way, in a way helps keep down the potential for, you know, that, that echo chamber to, to creep in where, you know, someone steps in and you may in effect shames them and that just causes them to dismiss you and the opportunity for real growth is lost is lost so we're hoping through this for the for the men and women who participate this year to get a chance to um to experience what it is to um excuse me to have the space to sort out for themselves you know how they feel on these on the various historical moments outlined in the book and come to their own conclusion about whether or not they want, whether or not the part of them that reacts in the way that it does, is that something they feel comfortable with? Or if it isn't, then, you know, that's something they can bring to their study partners or bring up in the group during the group discussion phase so that they can feel more aligned with what is the more accurate truth of America. Yeah, right. I want to pipe in there. It is yeah, we're not teaching history, and we're not teaching anybody to have a viewpoint. We're we're facilitating a journey, a journey of introspection. Yeah. Uh, well, I have a question from from someone that was emailed uh, to us. It uh, if I just read it, uh, can you talk about the role that action versus uh, or alongside of talking? and telling stories has in the work of furthering racial progress. Sometimes it seems there's an action bias, um, parentheses, fix it fast, example, DEI departments created but not funded or sustained in large companies, et cetera, that doesn't really support change. Uh, where does courage to look fit in the spectrum of action slash storytelling and introspection? So yeah, we're not even asking people to take action because I think we fundamentally believe that if you see, if we see the truth about ourselves as a society and understand the truths about ourselves personally, that it is a natural thing, like a flower unfolding to want to open up to the world. Wow. Well said, gentlemen. So I noticed that you, it's a lousy transition. I noticed that you guys said there's going to be some groups and stuff. So where is, where is this course? Is it in Los Angeles? Is it in New York? Is it in Antarctica? Where, where are you guys going to hold this course at? Antarctica. Oh, I'm in. I've always wanted to go there. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> where is it going to be? How, how are you going to host this? Yeah, it takes place over uh, four Zoom sessions. So, at, so last time we had people connect from Canada and the East Coast. Um, oh, wow. So, um, yeah, we were just fortunate that um, the people who signed up were, you know, that committed to, you know, sacrifice their sleep or, you know, their, their schedule to spend uh, four Saturdays with us. But, um, but yeah, we, the meetings will be about two hours long, which on one of the surface might seem like a lot, but, you know, with a different type of, um, uh, like we have multimedia prompts, like we'll watch videos and then we'll kind of react as a group. And then there'll also be some group discussion. So, um, so basically, to answer your question, it'll all be over Zoom. But uh, I think by you no know, this point, a lot of people like I'm asking yourself, you know, as a live streamer, and the rest of us were all familiar with Zoom, so um, it should be something familiar to people. And here's the challenge: um, uh, it's three years into after the, you know, now we're in the endemic. Three years after the beginning of COVID, uh, now people are basically Zoom fatigued. 
And so, number one, it takes courage. <laughs> number one, it takes courage to <laughs> want to engage in this, in this, in this, uh, in this dialogue, in this conversation, in this journey. And number two, um, how are we going to get people to mm, give of their disposable time to say that this is important enough? Look, COVID changed our lifestyles. There is Zoom fatigue, but it has changed. More people are open to this. I can tell you from stuff that I've done on my own, my own business that I have, I went from 10% of my clients meeting me via video or whatever, FaceTime, however. Yes, I've done interviews like this. <laughs> the phone's right in front of me. Now I'm at 60 to 65%. So there is an opportunity that we have gone through this and we've gotten, well, we've gotten to the point where we are. This is not a conversation of COVID, but it, we are where we are, right, gentlemen? And we have that opportunity. And even though you do mention Zoom fatigue, which is very real, it opens up to a much greater audience because we've had this experience. A mutual shared experience, Zoom fatigue. Hmm. <laughs> Didn't think about that, but yes. So what are we looking at? The course you mentioned for weekends or four yeah, sessions? Four weekends. Two hours okay. uh, for four weekends starting uh, May 20th, going into the second uh, Saturday of September. May 20th? Uh, Did you say May 20th? May 20th, yes. Oh, <laughs> wait a minute. That's like 10 days away. 10 days away, yeah. Uh, but it, uh, 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 let me just talk about, uh, it's not just Zoom. It's, it's one reading about 30 pages a week from the book. I mean, if, you, if you're able to read 30 pages, you'll keep up with the book. And frankly, you know, if you don't keep up with the book, you can talk to your study partners and, and you know, have them fill you in. Part of the design of our project is the study partner element in which you don't have to Zoom. You can FaceTime, you can pick up the phone, or you can email and say, hey, I read about the, um, uh, the, 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 the graphic stories of the slaughter of uh, Native Americans when, when uh, at the time of the of the of the uh, so-called pilgrims uh, to the United States, and I'm having a hard time with this, or I can't read beyond that page. Do you want to? Can you talk? This is what we're trying to. You know, this is the element where we've put into the course. Pick up the phone. Talk about race. Talk about um, uh, uh, what has. Uh, uh, happened in our history, pick up the phone and talk what, uh, about what just happened in Buffalo. Excellent. Excellent. Gentlemen, what else do you wish to add? What else do you wish to cover that I cut you off on? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 just write to us at courage to look at um, you know, if you didn't get any of the previous links, we can send you materials to look at if you're on the fence. But um, maybe both Chris and I can leave um, people with a with a something to think about. Um, and, and I'm just going to go back to that thing that just sort of haunted me. You know, if we can if we can rebuild the uh, uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in X number of years, what is it worth our posterity, our children, and our grandchildren to say at the end of our lives? that I, I did something to help rebuild society. Yes, and all I would add, or not to add, because that was, that was very impressive, I would just say that um, we're asking you know, people to begin to have conversations and you know, something we're all kind of born with. And kind of to Eugene's point, like, you know, when we take up, the task to, in this case, look for courage, you know, on race or in other aspects of our life, we begin to change. And then with that, we begin to change the world in very so small, but so perceptible ways. So I, you know, I invite anyone who is at, in any way interested to um, unpack their, um, their experiences and uh, their knowledge of history, or just to um, get to a better understanding of 
you know why the country is the way it is to to reach out to us and we'd be more than happy to hear from you ladies yeah. and gentlemen oh no, no thank no. you thanks for having us roger yeah, yeah i i was only going to say folks it's 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 about the experience this is what life is and life is not hiding behind your door not hiding behind your car as you drive it is actually engaging and this is how we as a society as a race we grew up with engagement and when there is no engagement we have fear and fear leads dare i say to anger it leads to darkness and it leads to actions that what we can witness every day on cable on television and the internet it starts here the first step and it starts with reading the book a different mirror it's right there and speaking to these wonderful fine gentlemen here who are brave enough to want to tackle the subject and i applaud you i respect you i admire you and i look forward to hearing where this goes further so thanks roger we're, Thank you. we're we're gonna stay on this so ladies and gentlemen and sure enough i blew it there it is <laughs> all right <laughs> and uh we're good so ladies and gentlemen i thank you directed right there courage to look at gmail.com and go read the comments at courage to look dot blogspot.com and for those that are only listening it is courage the number two look dot blogspot.com so ladies and gentlemen that's going to call it right now for us at this moment we're going to continue this conversation and me thinks that we're going to be talking about this as we move forward but for now i thank chris jameson and i also thank eugene castillo i thank everyone that commented in the chat room I know you're going to be doing it after the fact, but I thank you for spending your time with us. Tiffany, uh, Tony, thank you. Appreciate it. Folks, it's not about remaining angry. It's just about thinking that there are other eyes that see things differently. And if you're willing to have that conversation, that's where things change. We are out of here. We'll see you guys on the other side. Gentlemen, thank you. All right. Take care.